This next lecture I'm going to talk about Vincent van Gogh and uh, his life and the structure of this lecture that I want to lay out for you is basically I'm going to talk quickly about his biographical life and some of the uh, sort of controversies surrounding his biography and some of the misinterpretations of what might have happened and then I'm going to analyze uh, two or three paintings in depth going into them in formal analysis and then in symbolic analysis. To start with, I think that there's a lot of uh, data about Vincent van Gogh that comes initially from a collected works of his letters. You can, you can find this, I think it's called Dear Vincent. No, it's called Dear Theo, <laughs> T-H-E-O. And um, basically it's a uh, correspondence between Theo van Gogh and his um, and his older brother Vincent and Theo basically took care of his brother throughout his entire life and a lot of the interpretations of the paintings and a lot of understanding about Vincent van Gogh's work comes from that and also some things about his biography but of course he didn't write about every single thing that happened to him so the top knowledge the pop knowledge that everybody knows first of all, or thinks that they know, is that Vincent van Gogh was a sort of melancholic, uh, depressed, crazy guy, and he cut off his ear, and then he committed suicide at the end of his life. I mean, that's what everybody seems to know about him. And initially, that kind of information, it might be overblown, and there's some debate about especially those two events. For instance, um, recent data, recent factual evidence has sort of come to light that it's possible that he got into a fight with his roommate Paul Gauguin and Gauguin actually was an expert fencer and might have sliced Vincent's ear. So maybe that high point which is a really dramatic story doesn't count. And then the end of his life where he seems to be depressed and there's some accounts about him uh, being in a cornfield and saying he just couldn't take it, I can't do it, I can't do it, it can't be done, it's impossible, um, and then he shot himself in the stomach, might also be a misapprehension of some of the facts because some evidence has come to light to suggest that he didn't shoot himself but was accident accidentally shot by two young boys and um, he liked those kids and basically maybe it was one of those incidents where kids are playing with guns and he got shot accidentally and he was covering for them. Nevertheless, his life makes a good story, and I think that's kind of important stuff to discuss. So let's go a little bit into his life. Um, and what I'm using as the source to look at his life as sort of as an armature for this uh, part of the lecture is um, from the Van Gogh Museum. And you can see the URL at the top of the uh, page there. And I'm going to just use it as the armature for the biographical part. When he was a young kid, basically, he grew up in a very religious family. Um, his father was very uh, strict. Um, he had some connections to upper, um, upper middle class culture because he had as a cousin and an uncle who's an art dealer. And um, he basically starts his early life in a very fundamentalist religious household in Holland, uh, more or less. After a while, he grows up, he's fairly educated, and he begins to uh, decide he wants to leave, and so he goes to Paris. And uh, while he's in Paris and he is uh, working as an art dealer, uh, according to some accounts in a couple of the books that uh, I've read, there's one that really has made his whole reputation that was published, I think, in the 30s or 40s called um, Lust for Life. Uh, by Irving Stone, and you might want to uh, read that. It's very long. I read it when I was a kid, and it really uh, fired my imagination up. I read it when I was about 14 years old. So he works in Paris as an art dealer. And then he ends up moving to um, London, where he continues to work, and then he gets into trouble with some young woman he falls in love with, and there's all kinds of... Uh, problems um, with his social interactions with people and it's suggested in the novel that he basically was stalking uh, the daughter of one of the uh, women 
uh, in the boarding house where he lived. And so he might have started to kind of go nuts. There might have been some things going on with him that made him behave and act in a socially awkward way. And Irving Stone certainly plays that up in the, in the novel. And you can see shades of that in some of the letters. He loses his job. There's a couple of little episodes where he works at a boys' school and stuff like that. But basically, he loses his job, and he enrolls in a sort of school to learn how to be uh, a minister, uh, one of those uh, evangelical sort of fundamentalist ministers who goes off and, and has a mission. And he went to a place called the Borinage in uh, Belgium, which is a coal mining town and was completely depressing and really horrible. And um, he gave away all of his stuff, according to the letters. And um, so he's working as a preacher. He's, he does draw, but he's not really interested in it in quite the same way. And he has a, a psychological and physical meltdown and his younger brother, Teo, rescues him. So he goes through these phases where he decides that um, the one thing he can do is really become a, an artist. And um, so he decides he's going to um, start studying and doing his thing. His, uh, his brother, Teo, is uh, supporting him financially. And he ends up falling in love with his cousin. And it seems like he was stalking her as well. So there's some weird stuff going on there. And um, so the end result... His, um, he becomes more and more crazy, I guess, and associates more with street people who would be more accepting of him. He goes to The Hague, and um, basically he gets this uh, pretty famous cousin of his, Anton Mauve at the time, was... Uh, doing very well and, and made these really nice romantic paintings. And, and so Mauve... Uh, gives him plaster cast, tries to teach him to paint, uh, gives him some cash, tries to help him out. But Van Gogh is kind of in this weird spiral where he's partially, um, uh, he's associating with a very low class of people. He's socially awkward um, and he has a hard time dealing with it. And he ends up staying with a, a prostitute who takes care of him. And there's, there's a big, uh, um, to do about that in the novel and and also in the film by Vincent Minnelli called Lust for Life. Uh, but basically he has to flee The Hague because after a while he's in trouble and doesn't have any money. He goes to the Netherlands and he ends up making these sort of what I consider to be fairly ugly little paintings that are supposed to be knockoffs in some way of Rembrandt style. But because he doesn't really understand <clears throat> anatomy and drawing in quite the same way that he should uh, to do a Rembrandt-esque kind of painting. And he really doesn't understand color and especially earth tone color and hasn't been trained properly. He makes these sort of muddy little peasant paintings that I think are, are fairly unattractive, but people tend to make a big deal out of it as if he is already manifesting his so-called genius at the time. And he continues to paint and he travels around. So there's much to do about the fact that he was kind of a wanderer. He ends up in Paris where he falls in with a, a crowd that actually is really good for him, but also really kind of bad for him. He, he meets uh, uh, Gauguin, Toulouse-Lautrec, uh, Bernard, Pizarro, John Russell. I, I also, th I thought he met... Um, Monet, but he might have just seen some of the works of Monet and Degas because, of course, he was kind of a weird guy. And so when he would go to bars, he was kind of on the outskirts. If you watch the film, it really does, it makes a caricature of it. It's uh, it's great theater, but I'm not sure how accurate it is. After his influence by going to Paris and seeing um, especially Seurat and Monet, he has a total epiphany in terms of painting and I think this is what leads him to do his really revolutionary stuff where um, I think there's a combination of the fact that he's kind of out of the art world because he'll move to Arles after this and um, he is just doing what he does best but since he doesn't have a lot of people critiquing him and giving him a hard time he just keeps working and working and working and he's the hardest critic on himself that he could be. Like Rembrandt, one of the things that he does a lot of, and I think this is pretty cool, and I've been showing you some of these, is um, 
is his series of self-portraits. And like Rembrandt, these self-portraits are kind of psychological and kind of show where he was at during his life. He continues to experiment with color. Uh, he does a lot of uh, textural things. He sort of steals little passages from Paul Seurat and from Monet. Um, I, I don't think he's related really in his painting to Cezanne, who was working around this time period, but maybe Manet had a bit of an influence too. He can't handle Paris. <laughs> um, and his brother basically and he uh, get him this house called the Yellow House in Arles. And um, he ends up living with Paul Gauguin there. And when he Paul Gauguin comes to visit him, he does a whole room of sunflowers for him and, and makes all these beautiful paintings. It seems like he was painting literally like an obsessive compulsive. And what I'm talking about is he kept working so much that he would um, sometimes make two to three paintings a day and a bunch of sketches. He just couldn't stop. And in the act of making so many paintings, he really did learn how to become quite a good painter. You can see that some of the, um, there's some awkward things in, in the painting. There's some awkward drawing and, and passages, but intuitively he really had an ability and a talent. Um, there's an author named Malcolm Gladwell who talks about the idea that you need to do something for 10,000 10, hours to be good at it. And he cites a whole bunch of famous people, including uh, Bill Gates and, and Jobs and stuff like that. Um, but I think Van Gogh painted so much that he really began to discern uh, color things, really understood some things. Um, but he has a, a, a fallout with Paul Gauguin, and uh, eventually he, he has to leave. Uh, because he got into some kind of um, argument with Paul Gauguin. And, and, the, and the problem is, is that it seems like he might have cut his ear. Um, he might have given it to a prostitute. We're not really sure, but uh, we know that he kind of had a meltdown. And the specifics around the story seem to be that he got into some kind of argument or some kind of row in a bar or uh, at home with Paul Gauguin. And then the next morning when the police come, they see Van Gogh is uh, in his bed. Um, with his ear bleeding and he's nearly dead and Paul Gauguin seems to um, deny any knowledge of what happened and took off. It's very possible that he might have picked up a sword and cut his ear. So he goes to a hospital and then he goes to an asylum and uh, he basically stays in this asylum and um, because he has these sort of nervous attacks and we're not really sure what they are but he basically probably had some kind of psychotic uh, break. He might have been even schizophrenic. I mean, all of this is like conjecture, so who knows? But he's in this uh, asylum, and he begins to paint, and he begins to enjoy painting and, and making some good paintings. And he um, is uh, back to thinking about religion, and, and um, he seems to be adjusting pretty well. So he returns to San Remy and he gets a doctor and the doctor Dr. Gachet decides that he is um, Dr. Gachet is a bit of a dilettante he um, he likes painting and he collects work by other artists and he helps artists with uh, with um, artist blocks and it seems like he was prescribing uh, some sort of homeopathic medicine for him I think it was some sort of Eryngian or some kind of uh, drug in fact, um, there's a painting that uh, shows uh, Vincent um, or Dr. Gachet sitting in front of a plant that some uh, botanists have said is a, a drug that was used to treat him. So what happens is the doctor decides that he should work as much as he can and that will help him. And he paints so much that he basically seems to have a flip out and seems to be having episodes if you believe the biographies. But um, the biographies make a big deal about this cornfield with crows as a uh, iconographically it kind of shows that he um, the crows symbolize death and he's about to die and some of his letters sort of indicate a lot of depression but I think what really happens is um, it's possible that he was in a cornfield and uh, what literally happened to him was that um, he didn't commit suicide but that he got shot in the stomach by those two kids and he dies 
Nevertheless, it it seems like he might have um, uh, really did commit suicide or that there was definitely mental illness in the family. Because after he dies, his younger brother basically has a meltdown and, and, and dies too. Um, and, uh, and I think that there was some kind of codependent link between the two. I'm sorry if this is a very casual kind of uh, biography of, of the life and times of Van Gogh, but this is kind of how I see it. And I think sometimes too much is made of his genius. In this next section, what I'd like to do is uh, analyze uh, three or four of Van Gogh's paintings. I suppose you should call him Vincent because Van Gogh means literally from Van Gogh. Uh, but anyway, um, what I'd like to do is analyze um, a couple of his paintings in terms of their formal qualities, meaning paint quality, line, color, texture, that kind of stuff. And then I'd like to talk about the iconography. And so this painting which is also the subject of a song called Starry Night by um, Don McLean, uh, is probably one of his masterworks. It's very recognizable. And if you look at the painting, I think the first thing that you'll notice is the color is kind of posterish. And I have this suspicion that one of the reasons why Van Gogh's paintings became so popular, especially in the 30s and 40s, were they were so um, clear in their color and line that they reproduced very well in art books and on posters. The other thing is when he died, he left a lot of work behind, and it was like a complete body of work because I think he had only sold one or two paintings his whole life. So in terms of the line quality, the first thing that I want you to see is he uses a lot of paint texture, and you can't really see this in, um, in a reproduction. It's kind of hard to see how well, uh, how thick the impostos and, and sort of lines are, but you can see that the sky is almost a series of dashes and dots that kind of combine in your eye using optical mixing, which is a, a technique that is somewhat like Seurat, and also somewhat like Monet and Degas, especially Degas in his pastel technique does this. So he's using these counterbalancing sort of swirling lines in the sky um, to describe how he saw the, the sky. And he, there's a letter in which he kind of talks about this. And um, the counterbalancing sort of curvilinear S-curve lines in the sky make it feel very active and alive and those lines are kind of echoed in other places throughout the painting. For instance, the cypress tree on the left hand side has these sort of flame-like pattern of lines going up and, and into the, the stars in the sky above. Even the mountains in the background kind of have some cross contouring and uh, some lines that seem to echo uh, the soft, gentle curves in the sky. Then you get to the church and the buildings below, which are actually geometric forms, very blocky, uh, very clear, and everything seems to be even kind of outlined in his painting. So that's kind of almost diagrammatic, it's almost poster-like, it's almost cartoon-like in how he's handling things. But he does use some optical mixing in the color, but he tends to use almost straight out of the tube color quite a bit. He doesn't modulate the color, he's not interested in chiaroscuro, the shading or light and shadow, he's really interested in color effects, but not like Monet or Degas, because Monet and Degas were recording the passage of colored light, and so they were sort of breaking down the forms into colored light and recording an impression of what they see. I think the difference is Van Gogh is interpreting what he sees, and he's actually drawing it almost in a cartoon-like way so you'll understand what's going on. So what's the interpretation then? Well, based on some things from the letters and based on from uh, some interpretations, probably the, the cl uh, closest interpretation that I feel is reasonable is the fact that it has to do almost with a story that comes from St. Augustine. And we, when we studied Masaccio uh, and we talked about the city of God and the city of man, according to St. Augustine um, in his text, Basically, remember Vincent was a very religious man and had studied a lot of theology and understood religion, and he talks about this quite a lot. And for him, the landscape was a symbol of God's will and almost 
reaching back to Caspar David Friedrich in a way what Van Gogh is kind of doing is, is making a statement that the landscape stands for the power of God in a way. So if that's true, look how small the city is and the church and the steeple. It barely touches. And if you looked at that in an Augustinian interpretation, you could actually say that that's the city of man. It's the temporary world where people try to reach God, but they can't quite. Um, the tree on the left-hand side is a cypress tree that was often planted as grave markers for people because they couldn't afford graves. And so it's possible, not clearly evidenced, that um, that, that tree might be an interpretation of sort of nature's ability to, to be eternal and reach up into the skies and um, that the mountains go on forever in the landscape. And this is a lot like those ideas we discussed in, um, in the Masaccio painting, uh, The Tribute Money. I wanted to discuss um, one of Van Gogh's self-portraits a little bit more in depth because I think that it, it really pays to take a look at it and think about it in a real way um, as a formal object. First of all, the paint on this is very, very thick, and the pattern in the background you'll remember that we just saw in the sky of Starry Night. And if you get closer to the face, one of the things that you'll see is he breaks the pattern of marks down almost like they are Degas marks when Degas or Mary Cassatt um, uses pastel to describe the modeling of shade and pattern and light and shadow on the face. Um, it's almost pointless, but it's more like little dashes in the face. So he handles the face with a different kind of texture. The hair is a different texture and the lines go a different direction. The background is a sort of almost mechanical wave-like form. It's uh, sort of uh, mechanically made but organic with the counterbalancing curves. And then the clothing is a dia it's a quick diagram. It's an outline of the forms and then some quick curvilinear lines that describe the drapery going around the arms and, and how the drapery is moving, what direction. And that's called cross contouring we're seeing going across the figure. So in essence, if you look at this painting, it shows a variety of techniques and you know the drawing's pretty good. That's a pretty accurate portrait of Van Gogh. So that's uh, another thing to appreciate about Van Gogh's paintings and, and to see what he's doing. Now, just to return for a moment to his former period as a sort of contrast, these potato eater paintings that he did before this show, I believe, a real lack of skill. Uh, he's learning how to paint, and he's and because he's a, a master painter, people want to see early signs of genius in this. But I, I've seen uh, students' work that looks just as awkward and just as weird. I mean, there's something kind of cool about the line quality and how blocky he does things, the caricaturing he does. But I don't think it's a very good painting, and uh, he certainly doesn't have a handle on color, even low key color. The last painting I want to talk about is a painting of his room in Arles. And what I wanted to discuss about it was um, basically from a formal point of view, it looks like the perspective is kind of skewed or off, but it isn't. <laughs> he did several versions of this painting. There's one in New York that I was able to stand near. And uh, when you get really up close to the painting, and you sit near it the way that he would have painted. This room is really tiny. And so there's a curvature in your eyeball that when you're on top of a canvas, you can't compensate for it when you're sitting right on top of it. And that is also sort of combined with the fact that the room itself is actually not completely straight. One of the corners of the room kind of goes off at a wacky angle. And so what Van Gogh is, is doing in his uh, painting is he's actually painting almost uh, optically correctly the, what he sees in front of him and the distortions that happen while he's painting on the canvas do that as well. I also want to point out some like lovely little things that I think make it a good painting. I think that the contour lines, those outlines around objects, kind of add to the forms and, and make them solid and sort of posterish. But then he also does some things with texture, and he follows, for instance, the lines in the floor with the, with the paint quality uh, when the end of the uh, the 
the bed uh, frame is vertical. He uses vertical stripes uh, in, in paint, vertical paint quality to do that. Um, and it really has an intimacy. And the color sense is really kind of cool. If you think about the color that Van Gogh uses, he tends to use really bright, intense, saturated colors, but he likes to play off warm and cool relationships. For instance, that bed is sort of an orange, and then the walls are blue. And that really makes that bed project forward, and it makes it a much more interesting painting in some ways. Now, iconographically, um, I, I suppose you could relate it even probably to a place that you go, for instance, your bedroom or a favorite space that's yours. I think in the case of Vincent, this was a small, controllable space. He could have his artwork. It was He set it up very orderly. Um, and I think it was a safe place for him because that's the feeling I get from looking at the painting. Of course, I'm being a little interpretive here, and, and there's a possibility that that may not be the case.